Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as we discuss surviving parenting in a pandemic. It's so nice to get together as a community, especially during times of isolation and with a collective experience that many of us are understanding right now, like parenting during a pandemic. <laughs> uh, my name is Sony, and I am the mental health lead and manager of student mental health services here at Wellington Catholic. And I am a parent of two young children, one of them who just started school this year. Um, and I would like to begin by introducing our wonderful and incredible and knowledgeable presenters today. So we have Deb Waters, if Deb is there. Hi, Deb. Uh, we have Deb Waters, who is an early years program coordinator. Deb has extensive experience in early childhood development and is a parent herself. We have Mary Ogan Soye, Mary can wave. She is one of our mental health clinicians and is a parent to two daycare age children, so very little. Uh, next, we have Colleen Keene. Uh, she's our social worker from St. John Bosco and a parent of two school-aged boys, very sweet school-aged boys. And then we have Cindy Carter, who is our mental health clinician and parent to two elementary age children. So Cindy, if you can wave. And we have Michelle Haslett, who is our social worker from St. James and a parent of two also really incredible young boys. Uh, we put this short webinar together after having several parents express similar concerns and, and we seem to be hearing these same concerns over and over and truthfully at times, like I can, I know I'm speaking for myself and, and possibly some of our colleagues here, that we are also feeling those same worries as caregivers for our children. So throughout this webinar, we're uh, hoping that we'll be answering some of the most common questions that have come up since the pandemic started in March of last year. Uh, Deb will be looking at some of the most commonly asked questions about academics. So aren't our kids falling behind and how can we possibly fill these gaps for our kids? Mary uh, will be walking us through what stress looks like in relation to the human brain, whether you're a child, teen or adult. Colleen will be walking us through um, how that stress that Mary talked about um, has played out for us as parents and, and our children and our families during this pandemic. And we know that connection to loved ones is one of the most impactful and powerful ways of managing stress or traumatic situations. So together, Cindy and Michelle will explore how we can continue to promote critical connection, that secure attachment, that healthy bond with our children despite these difficult times. Um, which ultimately in the end, we know from all the research promotes resiliency in our kids and our families. We will be recording this webinar, so you likely have noticed that it's, it's recording, and that's for anyone who would like to view this again later. Feel, uh, please feel free to enter any questions that you do have in the chat, and we will compile a frequently asked question, and um, along with some other helpful resources, we will send that out after the webinar, possibly early next week. And uh, we're going to try to really hard to keep it under an hour, as promised, um, because we do recognize as caregivers of young children, we likely have a million and one things on the go this evening. <laughs> so we're going to try to keep it short and sweet. So off to you, Deb. Thanks, Sony. Um, really glad to see everybody here today and um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, as Sony uh, mentioned, this is um, a webinar about surviving parenting in a pandemic. So Nick, if I can just get you to flip to the next slide. Um, so here's some questions that are floating in the air, conversations people that are having. What about all the lost time that our um, children, um, you know, school that they've been missing, activities, how are kids going to catch up? And students are falling behind, how are we going to fill the gaps? Um, so these are worries and stresses that we have along with all the others and all the other worries and stresses that have come up through COVID and the pandemic. So um, when we look at the next slide, um, if we can look at, um, I think Nick's gonna flip that for me. Thanks, Nick. Um, well, as we're waiting, there we go. How can we look at those questions about gap filling and about what have they lost? And um, how can we look at those through an asset lens? Um, one thing is to realize that um, we know learning has not stopped, but a different kind of learning is ha has happened and continues to happen. And that time has not been lost, but in fact has been invested in surviving 
a historic time in our children's lives. Um, some of this, some of the learning that's happened for our children and our families um, have nurtured lifelong skills um, that our kids will use long into the future. And one thing to note is that our children have been amazing at adapting over and over and over again to different situations in their homes, um, at, um, at school, and in their communities. And this ability to um, adapt and be flexible is amazing and also is a skill that um, our children will take um, in, long into their lives and use when um, other situations come up in their lives that that practice of the uh, adapting and being flexible is so important. Um, on the next slide, we can look at, um, at these things um, again from an asset lens and can we um, call ourselves to look at celebrating what we know kids have learned during the pandemic instead of what we've expected them to learn. So in conversations with colleagues and in um, research that I've done and speaking with educators and with kids, um, five kind of themes came forward for me um, of skills and knowledge that have been developed throughout this time, and that is self-advocacy, resilience, digital literacy, and this is something just, you know, how amazing it is that our youngsters can, you know, uh, mute on and unmute and put the camera on, take the camera off, share the screen, so many skills that um, have been developed. Um, empathy and compassion, um, is built within their families, um, in their online classrooms, in their uh, bricks and mortar classrooms, and just generally a global understanding of that empathy and compassion are needed um, as the world travels through something that it's never traveled through before. And also, and also patience. Um, and we'll be talking more about that later. Um, the, the next slide shows um, a quote that I, um, that I saw, I think it was on Facebook or Twitter, and um, it was Facebook, and it was a mom sharing a story of, she was working with her son who maybe was maybe seven or eight, and he was saying, mama, I just really don't want to do this remote learning anymore. This is really hard. And she acknowledged that how hard it was. And in fact, what she said was to him, no kid in the history of kids have ever had to do what you're doing right now we are making history which is something that we need to acknowledge to our kids and to ourselves um so the connection i made to this was um in 2016 the ministry put out a document called 21st century competencies and the, this document focuses on um the competencies that that um they'd identified through research um that our kids will need in the future. And the competencies include critical thinking, problem solving, innovation, and creativity, self-aware and self-directed learning, collaboration, communication, and global citizenship. And when I looked at the connections between those competencies and the ones on the previous slide that I had gleaned from conversations I'd had and readings that I've done and speaking and speaking to kids and educators, there's a real connection between what, are, what, are, what the ministry has identified in 2016 as competences these that our kids will need as they move forward in their lives. They're, they're the very same competencies and skills that we've seen kids develop through all the changes that have been happening in our world through the pandemic. When we get back to school or um, as we are returning to school, depending on where your family's at. So the next slide, thanks Nick, is um, what will it look like in our schools? So um, it may be that your student is in remote learning, our virtual school or was in remote learning, has returned or is thinking of returning. Um, some really important points we need to um, identify as far as school goes is that we, we'll make sure that kids have a time and a place to share their feelings about living through this time, including you know, fear, loss, loneliness, and sadness, which are all emotions that we, we've all experienced during this time. Um, acknowledging that families will have experienced um, 
a diverse variety of ways of coping um, and that all of those experiences will be honored. Some kids and families may have thrived during remote learning. And so if kids are coming back or families have chosen to send their kids back, there's that transition as well. Um, as always, we will differentiate instruction. Uh, like it, we, we always assess kids and um, know where they're at and base our instruction on, on need and move forward from them, from there. Um, and most importantly, we will focus on connections, relationships, and social emotional health. Uh, students have been missing connections with teachers and friends and their school family. Um, it's important for us to acknowledge as educators and as parents that the most important thing is that um, these connections are re-established and um, that the connections and safety that kids get from belonging to a classroom family in a school community is, is number one. Um, so that joy and connection, uh, that feeling of joy and connection are the most important part of school life. Academics actually happen. Research tells us that ac academics happen and kids excel in academics when relationships are, are at the very core of what we do. Um, and again, just reiterating, allow yourself to focus on the wonderful things your children and you have learned in spite of COVID because so much great learning has happened. So I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Mary, who's gonna talk about stress and the impact of stress on the brain. Thank you, Deb. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. So very brief briefly, we wanted to review with, uh, with us, uh, just go a little bit of an overview of what stress is, um, how stress impacts, the impact of stress on our brain. Um, so what this looks like physiologically for us and our relationships. And then uh, we'll cover a little bit about how to calm the brain in those moments. Um, next slide, please. So what is stress? So what we wanted to highlight here is the difference between stress and stressors. So stressors are the things or events that are happening around us um, that are occurring in our environment um, at the time, whereas stress is our internal response to those things that are happening. So if you look at those pictures there where, you know, the dog is just sitting drinking his tea or coffee um, and there's a fire um, going on around him. Um, and then the other one with the lady who's got all these uh, stressors coming at her. So we just wanted to reiterate uh, what the difference between stress and stressors. So COVID right now is the stressor, the collective stressor that we are all experiencing and it is impacting all of us in various ways and as parents we've been bombarded with an increase in the stressors due to the due to this pandemic such as um, fear of uh, our health or the health of our loved ones social isolation for us and our children um, some of us are returning to work some of our children are returning to school there's the um stresses of finances, family, and family relationships, which are no more stresses, stressors, but they're increased right now because of the impact of, uh, of the pandemic. And then lastly, like Deb talked about, there's these worries for our kids, you know, that they'll be, be behind socially, emotionally, um, and academically as well. So stress is how we perceive or how we respond to these things. Um, the response for us can look like, depending on who we are, can look like fight, flight, or freeze, which we're going to talk more about in the next slide. Um, basically, how we know that we are really stressed is that we will see, you know, a change in our baseline behavior. So um, we're not responding as we normally would. We're not, you know, our usual uh like some might say our usual fun loving self because there's just so much things going on. Those are usually like indicators to let us know that we are really, really feeling the stress. The important thing that we want um, us to rem remember tonight is that we don't need to change the stressor to have um, a positive impact or a positive response to it. So we don't need to have control over COVID or change COVID to experience a positive stress response. 
Um, stress is a necessary part of our development. Um, so not all stress is bad. And like Dr. Bruce Perry says, um, small doses of stress can actually build resiliency in us. Well, thanks, Nick. Next slide. That's the slide. Thank you. Um, so stress. So now we want to talk about the brain under stress. So stress impacts the brain physically and how it functions, which I'm sure um, you were probably aware when the brain is stressed, it is activate, it activated, it releases a hormone called, called cortisol. When there's high levels of cortisols in our brain, it can impact our ability to learn, regulate, um, and also um, problem solve. So I'll go over that a little bit. So stress impacts um, various parts of our brains, but the part that we wanted to focus on were two parts today that relates more directly to what we want to talk about today. So the first part of the brain that is activated where, when we are in high level of stress is the fear center, the amygdala in our brain. This is the part of the brain that puts us in fight, flight, or freeze mode. So that very black and white thinking, am I safe, am I unsafe, what do I need to do right now kind of thinking mode. Fight response looks like when we feel like charging at the stressor, when we're like, come on, COVID, bring it on, I'm ready for you. Um, and sometimes it can look like anger, like frequent anger, agitated, like sometimes inconsolable or possibly rage because um, we're in that fight response mode. Whereas flight response looks more like us wanting to back out, like we just want to leave, don't even want to touch it. We're not acknowledging that it's in the room. Um, we're using all kinds of distraction tactics just to get away, like not even acknowledging the stress at all. Whereas the freeze response is like the deer in the headlights look where um, you're like frozen. Um, you, it might look like you're shutting down. We might see like some kind of like being withdrawn. You might feel a little numb or lethargic. So those are the three types of responses that we have when that part of our brain is, um, when that um, when stress is activated, that part of our brain. While in that mode, uh, another part of our brain that gets activated is the prefrontal cortex. So this is a part that is associated with our social behaviors, our learning, our retaining, and our decision-making. So when this mode is activated, we are not able to learn. We can't interact, we can't recall, we can't retain, and we most certainly cannot make good decisions. So an example of this would be if my daughter, um, who's now four-year-old, is um, having a difficult time um, emotionally regulating herself, and I'm saying to her, use your words. You need to calm down. Remember mommy said this. You need to do this. And she just keeps, you know, going on with the tantrum. And then the social worker in me goes, oh, yeah, you can't actually, because when she's in that mode of high stress, she's, she can't remember anything that I've told her. She's not able to access that part of her brain to use those things in that moment. So I need to come up with how I help her come back so that she can reactivate that, those parts of her, her brain. So the most thing that we wanted you to remember here about stress in the brain is that our brain is not meant or created to stay in this fight or flight mode forever. So I'm going to pass it over to Colleen now, who's going to talk about how this might look specifically in our parenting and in our children, and then ways that we can cope in those moments. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and hello, everyone. It is so incredible to have so many of you joining us today. So thanks for your time. We appreciate that. OK, so this far we've heard about how the pandemic has interrupted the typical journey of learning for our kids and how learning might be more difficult given the shifts happening uh, in their brains when we when we all perceive threat. Now let's talk a bit about how these changes are affecting us, our caregiving and our children. We've been facing persistent threats of the pandemic for a year. We're no longer being chased by a bear, but we're fighting the modern day equivalent threat, COVID-19. Threats to our health, finances, and relationships have completely hijacked our lives. We've been stuck in fight or flight for a long time, and it's not without impact. Friends, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm tired. <laughs> I am breathless and exhausted from fighting or running from these threats. As Mary mentioned, we were never designed to stay in our fight or flight response for extended periods of time and for good reason. It's emotionally and physically taxing. So it's no wonder that this has had a trickle down effect uh, on our functioning and our caregiving. 
we may have noticed changes in the way we're responding and connecting with our kids. For example, I know I have found it more difficult at times to listen to my kids attentively or find the patience to help them solve another problem. At times, it seems I'm more forgetful or not fully absorbing what my kids are telling me. My mind feels occupied and distracted. My window of tolerance for stress seems to be shrinking. And although we may jump to tell ourselves that we're failing, friends, we need to remember that we're not. Our diminished bandwidth isn't because we're bad caregivers. It's because we've been fighting danger for a year. We're fatigued. We're responding the way humans do in the face of threat. Next slide, please. So then what do we do about this, right? <laughs> How do we calm our stress response in the moment so we're in a better space to engage with our kids? Believe it or not, calming our brain starts with calming our body. Breathe. <laughs> Simple and effective, breathing is a powerful tool to regulate our emotions. Through breath, we can activate the calming response in our body. Slow, even breaths can slow our heart rate and calm our body, actually helping us change the way we feel. When we're regulated, we're better able to help regulate our kids. Uh, another one, progressive muscle relaxation or PMR. It's another great calming technique and it's used by consciously tensing and relaxing the muscles in our body. So during particularly uh, stressful moments, this might look like relaxing excuse me, purposely relaxing your shoulders, releasing the tension in your jaw, taking a more relaxed stance, and softening your facial expression. This signals to not only our brain and body that we're safe, but it also signals to our kids that they're safe and they are calm. And we are calm, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. I jumped ahead. <laughs> uh, remembering compassion as another strategy. So self-compassion is being able to recognize that we make mistakes, uh, case in point, and forgive ourselves for it. Reminding ourselves that there's a reason we and our children are acting the way we are and that they need our help in that moment. That can actually help us view the whole situation from a more compassionate lens. And having a compassionate stance towards yourself and your child during those stressful moments can actually help change the way we respond. Now, next slide, please. So we've had a look at how the pandemic has impacted us and our parenting and a few ways to slow ourselves down in the moment. <laughs> Excuse me. Now let's shift our attention to look at what might be going on for our kids. Not surprisingly, our kids are not immune to fight, flight, freeze responses either. And actually their difficulties look quite similarly to ours. I'm going to use the analogy of an emotional cup, which some of you might already be familiar with. Let's imagine our children's ability to manage and face the world as being fueled by this internal emotional cup, a cup that needs refilling often with things like feeling connected to you or important others through play, story time or quiet snuggling, doing things that bring them joy like creating, climbing or exploring or even quiet time alone. All of these things help fill or refill their cups. When their emotional cups are full, our kids feel calm, they're emotionally regulated and a little more confident to work, uh, work through their world. On the other hand, there are numerous things that drain their cups and COVID has certainly removed some of the natural opportunities that they need to fill their cups. When their cups are empty is when we start to see some of the creative ways they attempt to fill their cup. So things like bouncing off the walls when they need a refill or misbehaving to get your attention, or needing a lot of reminders or redirection to show you that they need a refill, or seeming to have bottomless cups, needing constant refills. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've seen all of these things uh, and attempts from my own children over the past year. When their cups are empty, they struggle to remain regulated and calm, just like we do. So as I wrap up, a few takeaways just from this piece. You are not alone in your struggle to survive the demands of this incredibly stressful moment in our lives. You are not a bad parent or caregiver. You are responding the way humans do under threat. You have a few tools in your toolbox to help you manage in the moment, and your kids need you more than ever. Armed with this knowledge, I'd like to hand it over to Cindy and Michelle, who are going to talk to us a little bit about how we might support our kids differently and how we might fill their cups through connection.
Hello, everyone, and thanks, Colleen. So we've talked a little bit now just about our worries about our children's learning. We've talked about how stress has now been impacting our lives and our children's lives and how it's draining our emotional cups. So we really want to take a look at how our relationship with our children can be the thing that helps them help sustain them and helps get them through these difficult times. So to get us started, we just want to start by looking at this quote, which says, respond to your child with love in their worst moments, their broken moments, their angry moments, their selfish moments, their lonely moments, their frustrated moments, their inconvenient moments, because it is in their most unlovable human moments that they need most to feel loved. Next slide. So what is at that heart of that connection? It's what we call attachment. You might have heard this reference before, you might know a lot about this, but at the end of the day, attachment really is that emotional bond, that connection that exists between ourselves and our child. It is something that is vital for survival as well as for their healthy development. It is what promotes uh, appropriate behavior and social development in them. And it is something that exists beyond uh, our children and into our adult relationships as well. So we as adults have those attachment relationships among us with our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our partners. So if you can imagine attachment as an elastic band that connects us to our children. So it is invisible to the eye, but it is something that exists no matter how close how, or how far apart we get. That attachment is a bio biologically based human condition. We need to have proximity to our caregivers for safety and survival. And as parents, we find ourselves often feeling like that idea of the mama or papa bear, where we want nothing more than to protect our children, keep them safe, and help them thrive. So this uh, relationship, this connection that exists, is through reciprocal interaction with our children. And this looks like our child expressing a need and that we are cued to that need and then we respond to it. So over time, that response of us meeting the cued need is what builds that nice connection between us. So as our children get older and we start to see them wanting to be more independent and explore their world, we support them in going out and we support them through being present to that exploration. And when our children's needs are um, one of wanting comfort or protection once again, they know that we are waiting for them to come into for that support and for that help. So over time, you will see that going out and coming in looks different at different stages for our children, whether they be infants, toddlers, preschoolers, or are, as they've gone into elementary school. So what we want to do is just take this idea of the going out and coming in and make it uh, visual for you through the image of a circle. So I'm going to pass it over to Michelle so she can talk about that further. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to have a map for our children? Or what do they need? And so uh, there's a parenting program out there called Circle of Security, and they've really just done that for us. Um, so if we take a look at this diagram, this is the model we're going to use. You can see the hands on the side. That's us. That's the caregiver. We're the secure base and the safe haven. And then that elastic band that Cindy talked about is that circle. Right. So let's break this down a little bit more so it makes sense. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, like I said, we are the hands. We are that secure base. Um, when our kids go to get launched out in the world, or maybe we want to chuck them these days, it's been a long haul. Um, we're the that hand that does that. We shine them up, get them ready, and out they go. And then we're also ready to catch them when they need to come back in. So that's what that safe haven is. We're that spot, that safe landing zone for our kiddos. Um, I like to almost visualize it a little bit like our kids are boomerangs. So we chuck them out, they go out, do their thing, and then they come back and we catch them. And this is going 
going on over and over again in our relationship with our kids. Next slide, please. So if we look at the top of the circle, um, like I just said, that's where we're that secure base, that spot that they can kind of jump off and head out. Um, and this is when they're at the top of the circle. This is when they're looking for independence in their world and they're going out and exploring, but they still need us while they do that. Um, even though it'd be nice, even as adults, we need this. So as that secure base, it's our job when they're out there exploring the world to still watch over them, to delight in them while they're out there, to help them, and to enjoy with them. So what does this look like with our kids? Um, some examples that come to mind for me are when I think about watch over me, I know that my little guy is like the king of ninja moves right now. And so he's out there, hey mom, watch this. Hey mom, watch this. Look at this ninja kick, mom. Um, and I watch a lot of ninja kicks, but uh, that is him just wanting me to, to see what's going on for him out there. Um, the delight in me, how many times, hey dad, like watch me jump off this couch or, Obviously, I have very active little guys. Um, did you see that move? Wasn't that cool? And they want that feedback from you. Yes, that was awesome, buddy. Like, great, great job. So that's a need that they need uh, met for them when they're out there. They want us to delight in their experiences. They have help me moments when they're out there. So a good example of that is like, Grandma, I'm working on this Lego. This is mine. I'm, I'm going to get this together all myself. But there's this one part. I just don't understand the instructions. Can you help me? And they don't want you taking over, but they might need that little boost to, to keep that independence rolling for them. And then the last one would be enjoy with me. So, um, hey, Auntie, I know we've made 600000 uh, snow forts over the uh, the pandemic, but I just need you to do this one more with me because it's so fun. Can you do it with me? That's an enjoy with me moment. So as they're out exploring the world, they need us to still meet those needs. And if we can kind of watch for them, it helps to, to support their exploration. Next slide, please. And then at the bottom, we have our job as that safe haven. So they are always needing us to welcome us coming to them. When they when things have gone wrong, the need down there is connection, right? So the top was independence. The bottom, I need connection. And those primary needs that we see are protect me, comfort me, delight in me, and organize my feelings. Um, so as our, as the safe haven, there may be times where if I think of like a protect me moment that might come up, um, let's say that they're scared of COVID and that comes up, the, th the, talk, the talk about COVID, is the coronavirus gonna get me? The protect me moments there would be around, you know what, we're gonna learn how to wash our hands really well. And we're gonna learn how to wear our mask properly. And we're gonna also maybe redirect our kids from those moments where they're licking their hands or something after they've been out in public. Um, so those are protect me moments at the bottom of the circle. Comfort me moments, Maybe your kid has had to do that lovely COVID test, right? And it's funny how far a hug and some kind words and soothing can go in those comfort me moments. Delight in me, it seems weird that, you know, on the bottom of the circle, we still have big feelings, but we're going to delight in them. And a primary example, I see it a lot with my two, is my big guy gets really annoyed with my little guy. And he will come and say, mom, I'm, I'm going to blow, I'm going to hit, hit him. And so I, I delight in the fact that he actually came and talked to me about it. I'm so glad you came to me, buddy. Thanks so much for coming to me um, so that I'm not actually just breaking up a fist fight. So we delight in those moments as well. Um, and then when it comes to organize my feelings, we'll also see um, moments where this looks like, uh, you know, maybe we're having a big tantrum or a big outburst. Um, how do we manage those situations? What do we do there? Um, for example, with online schooling, we had a lot of meltdowns um, around that. And so naming, labeling those emotions, giving them the words that they don't have when those feelings get really big. So this is really frustrating. I see that for you. I know you probably miss your friends. It's hard to sit in front of the computer all day. That's that's an example of how we might organize feelings. And this is uh, for teens as well. They all have those same needs. They look a little bit different and we'll address some of that in the frequently asked questions. Next slide, please. 
Um, so when it comes to these circles, you're welcome for introducing circles. You're going to see them in every single relationship that you have because it is part of that attachment process. As an adult, I still circle into my parents. So I, I know my partner, he frustrates me sometimes and I'll pick up the phone and I talk to my dad and I need him just to vent, to organize how I'm feeling. And then I come back at the end and I am more, you know, regulated, ready to go about and be an independent adult and a parent again. So that's me using one of my circles. But like I said, we have them with every single relationship. Um, we usually feel more comfortable on either the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle. And that's a totally natural experience. Um, it depends on how you were parented and also some of your life experiences. So um, some of us might feel kind of anxious, you know, sending our kids out to do something or as they're out exploring the world. And other uh, ones of us, we may feel uncomfortable when there's really big feelings happening in front of us. We might have that internal feeling of I want to pull away. And so just starting to notice those things where are you more comfortable what can I do in those moments to kind of calm my own brain and then stay on that circle with my kid um, when we are also um, going through COVID and a global pandemic we're trying to figure this out for ourselves too um, and how we can you know deal with the circle and then our kids are also getting this, this circle situation where it's really tough. So we're spending a lot more time on the bottom of the circle, organizing feelings, being with them. You may actually hear a lot more of mom, can you play with me? And that's them trying to trying to make sense of the world and be with you and organize what's going on in their head. Um, so, yeah, I think with that, um, I, I, you know, just be give yourself some some leniency there but there's a lot of work that we're doing these days and we do acknowledge that so what do we do when we can't fix things um what do we do when we can't get rid of a pandemic or or something bad happening right away um there's a skill called being with and that's what cindy's going to take us through next great thank you michelle so at this point in time we've spent a lot of um time looking at, you know, where are those areas of struggle? And we know that when our children are at the bottom of the circle, they're needing so much more from us. So at the bottom of the circle, if you think back to what Mary was talking about, their amygdala is activated. They are experiencing that stress, that learning is not happening, and their emotional cup is likely empty. So this idea of being with, according to the circle of security, is defined as the need every child has for the caregiver to recognize and honor feelings by staying with core feelings rather than denying their importance. So I don't know about you, but as a parent, I want to make sure my kid is happy and healthy. I want to fix their boo-boos, shield them from struggle. And so sometimes when that happens, when their feelings get really big, and I think we all know what, what I mean by really big, we might want to pull away. We might want to pull away or we might want to jump in and fix it and not give that opportunity to just sit in those emotions because those emotions in our children bring on big emotions in us as well. However, the problem is when we do that, we deny our relationship our connection with them to have that opportunity to learn through that experience. And so we also know the other thing that can happen is that we might be worried about being with our children because it might reinforce behavior we don't want to see in them. The reality is when we are being with our kids and we're staying with that feeling with them, we're helping to calm the brain. We're building that connection with them. We are helping them to learn how to manage their own emotions. And so let's take a look at an example that maybe might feel um, more in line with our own experiences right now, just so that we can get a sense of what being with feels like for us as well. So let's use the example of having a really horrible day at work. You know, you come home through the door, the anger, the stress, the frustration is still seeping out of you. 
you're slamming things around, and then you start criticizing or yelling at your partner or your children because they haven't cleaned up after themselves. There's messes everywhere. Dinner hasn't been started. And so now imagine that your partner's response is to get angry back. They yell at you, and then they stalk off. Now imagine that instead, they try to understand what's going on. They acknowledge how upset you look and that it must be really difficult for you today. And they see how they can help. Which one of those responses feels better to you? Which one feels more helpful in that moment? So as you can see, being with is such an important thing for us to have that connection, to feel heard and to feel supported. So to help us sort of see it in action, we're gonna play a video clip for you. Um, it's from the movie Inside Out, so hopefully you're all familiar. And it really showcases nicely this idea of being with. Oh, the stuffed animal hall of pain. My rocket! Wait, Granny and I were still using that rocket. It, 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 it still has some soft power left. Who is your friend who likes to play? No! No, 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 you can't take my rocket to the dock. Granny and I are going to the moon. Riley can't be done with me. Okay, we can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone. Forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness. It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> 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 <sighs> 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 I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. So hopefully that video was just a nice way to kind of see uh, being within action. It really is about how do we meet them where they're at. So now we've talked about a lot of different things. We've talked about, you know, the stress and how it builds. And we've talked about this important need for our relationship with our children and how to be with them through the difficult times. And we've given you a little bit to think about in terms of some strategies that you can use for yourself, but we, we want to recognize that we too have an emotional cup. Next slide. So we may already have natural ways that we've built in activities to support the filling of all of our cups in our family life. We might have special things that we do just as our family, whether it be family reading, dance parties, building forts, 
Maybe it's special notes in their lunchbox or daily gratitude offerings at dinner or even a special movie night every week. So it's important to think about what are those natural things that you are already building into your family life that are adding to our cups. So we also want to look at, you know, what else do we need just as caregivers to help keep our cup full too? Because we know when our cup is empty, we're going to have a much harder time keeping our hands on the circle and being there for our children. So don't forget, we have circles too. We have those attachment relationships and we have people who are the hands on our circle. So think about your partners, your friends, your family, those people that you turn to in those moments. So how can they or how are they supporting your going out and your coming in? How are you using them to help meet your needs as well? Think about right now, are you in need of um, some independence? Are you looking for connection? And how are you using your circles to help with that? Have you found yourself lately with your hands off the circle? And what have you done to try and bring yourself back on? We as a team have some ideas of the things that we have built into our day, but also encourage you through the chat to share some of your ideas. What are the things that you're doing to fill your cups. Some of the things we talk about are keeping one earbud in and listening to a favorite song while you're building Lego for the thousandth time with your child. Maybe it's giving some screen time, whether that be TV show or a little bit of video gaming or even FaceTiming with grandma, just to allow you to have a moment to breathe, to step outside and to have a moment to yourself so that you can be ready again to face what's going on. Maybe it's after they go to bed. You have that time for yourself to watch TV, to read a book, to talk with your partner, to chat with a friend. So be thinking about those pieces. It's so important that our cup is full too, so that we can be the hands on the circle. I'm going to pass it over to Michelle. Okay, next slide, please, Nick. So we parent, we try our best, and we mess up, and we miss seeing and meeting needs. We're humans, and so then we mend. And I think this is more important now than ever. Um, every single relationship, we're going to have fights and frustrations. We're going to get it wrong. Um, and we're just not going to meet needs all the time. We can't. Um, we're also going through our first pandemic, trying to figure this out. And our cups are a little bit emptier sometimes. And then also we see behaviors in kiddos that maybe we haven't seen in a while, things that might look like regression, which are actually biologically make a ton of sense. So I know, for instance, my daycare drop-offs, they used to be kind of seamless. We've gone through this hard time and now I have a kid clinging to my leg again, or I have nowhere in my house I can go to without a little child finding me. And so these, these are things that are really tough and they make it really hard to keep our hands on the circle, but they make sense, right? Proximity to caregivers equals safety, um, but they, they drain us and they're hard. And so we mess up and we, we make mistakes. Um, so what do we do? Um, Cause they're going to happen and they're going to happen even more right now. Um, and so I think of those times when my hands are way, way off the circle. The first and foremost thing is I got to put on my own mask before I look after anybody else, just like on that airplane, right? So I might say, I need to take a second. I go take a big breath. I pet my dog because my dog is always nice to me. And then I come back. And I say, hey, guys, mommy really messed up here. I'm sorry that I was upset. Why don't we sit down and do a quiet activity? Because I think we all had some big feelings. And so that might be a way to repair as a family. Um, but they're going to happen. They're going to happen a lot. And it's totally natural. But that repair work is just as important in secure relationships. That's what actually teaches them some really great conflict resolution skills and helps us reconnect. Next slide, please. And there's awesome news. So the awesome news is that 
we don't need to get it right all the time. We are actually striving uh, for good enough parenting. And so we will try our best. We're going to step up to that plate every single time to be that secure base and that safe haven for our kiddos. Um, but we're not going to hit home runs all the time and we're going to miss needs. And so as research shows that as long as we are hitting needs 30% of the time that we get it right, that's good enough for develop, positive developmental outcomes. So keep that in your head when it's a rough day, when you haven't maybe had your hands on the circle as much as you would like, give yourself a little break. That, that wasn't part of my 30%. I always have the opportunity to repair and then move forward with my kids. Next slide, please. And so let's just remember, this is a good kind of quote to sum up the circle. Beneath every behavior, there's a feeling. And beneath each feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focusing on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause, not the symptom. Thank you. Here's Sony. Okay, so in wrapping up, I have a few things I would like to highlight from our webinar today um, in, in terms of how we can support our children through this pandemic and beyond. Uh, first, we want to be sure that we are acknowledging, labeling, helping to organize our children's big feeling, just like Cindy and Michelle talked about. Um, it's important to stop and recognize what do you need yourself in those really difficult moments so that you can be emotionally available and be the hands on the circle for your little one. Uh, try to focus on grounding yourself with those deep breaths like Colleen talked about. This will help calm your body, which will then calm your brain so that you can present um, and be present for your, your child as they're navigating their big feelings. Uh, Cindy talked about the skill of being with. The importance of sitting in those feelings with our children, a lot like Sadness did with Bing Bong and Inside Out, teaching our children that these big feelings, no matter how big they are or scary they might feel to us, are actually safe. Uh, and remember, just like Cindy and Michelle were talking about, good enough parenting is what we're aiming for here. And good enough parenting can absolutely still result in healthy, secure attachment that will promote resiliency in our children. And good enough parenting is only 30% of the time. And so you can ask yourself those really hard days, is this 30%? Oh, it's not? Okay, then I can mend this. I could do some repair. And if it is, that is good enough. Remember that our children will be okay. And as Deb mentioned, we will greet them at the door just as they come, meet them where they are developmentally and take it from there. That's our job. And that is what we're gonna do for all of our, stu our students and all of our children. So please give yourself permission to prioritize what you need to and let the rest go for now, especially if it's too much for your family. Uh, resilience does not mean that you need to persevere at all costs. It's about recognizing when you and your family need those emotional and mental breaks stopping that task to take that break that you need, uh, finding the courage to return to it later when you feel more energized, that's what builds resilience in our children. And resilient children we know are made and they're not born. So it's not the absence of stress that creates resilient children. And as Mary talked about, stress is absolutely essential to the healthy development and it's essential um, element of building resilience because there will always be stress. It's about knowing how to recognize when our emotional bandwidth is low and then prior prioritizing breaks in order to um, slow down, reconnect, energize so that we can keep on going. And then this is how we build resilience in our children and our families. Next slide, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of content that we tried to fit in in less than an hour. We're gonna take a look at the chat. Um, if there are questions, we're gonna make sure we answer those in a frequently asked question. And I will be sending out a feedback, um, a quick Google form, just, just so that we know if this was helpful for you, if we would like to see more webinars like this um, and in what topics. And, and I hear about teens, there's a need there too. So, um, if you could just take a minute to answer that, that would be incredibly helpful. And Nick, can you just come on camera for a quick second? <laughs> so I just really wanna thank Nick. Um, he's kind of been uh, the gentleman behind the screen uh, just helping with everything. And so thank you. I just wanna give a really big shout out to Nick for all his support um, with all the tech related stuff that I struggle with greatly. <laughs> so thank you so much. Have a lovely night and enjoy your families. Bye for now.